All right. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. And anybody that is new, welcome to the call. I think everybody has been here before, been on one of my calls. So, yeah, uh, excited to be here again this week on Tuesday on our with our with our mastermind. We actually got a chance to um, speak with Robert Martinez. And, you know, the topic I told him ahead of time was, can we talk about underwriting? Let's talk about underwriting. And of course, being the two time national apartment owner of the year, he went straight into operations. <laughs> but understanding and and it really made me think because understanding operations is actually extremely crucial to the underwriting process you know on this call i've been saying hey this is an underwriting call that means everything that leads up to closing the deal and not the operations afterwards you know and i don't know why maybe because i was like okay i wanted to keep them separated in case it was a separate call if i it, as if I couldn't have any more calls for the week for everybody to, to join. Um, but I was thinking of how important understanding operations really is for the underwriting process. You know, a lot of people are underwriting deals. And when you analyze deals, so when I say underwriting, I mean, when you're analyzing if something's a good deal or not, and you're running through the numbers, Right. Basically, what you want to know is you want to know that what is the cash flow? What's the total income for the property? What's the total expenses? And you take one, subtract the other. That's your that's your net operating income. And then from your net, you want to look at, OK, how much is my debt? Right. How much is the debt that I have to pay on this property? So if anybody wants to follow along, what would and we're going to talk about interest only a and I'm going to start using smaller numbers too. What would an $800,000 deal at a six and a half percent interest rate, interest only, cost a year? Please, Alex, repeat it. I will appreciate it. $800,000. Six and a half percent interest rate, interest only. How much is that for the year? How, what's your debt service? What's it going to cost you? What's it going to cost you a month, let's say, actually? Yeah. So 52K. So that means your mortgage is going to be $4,300 a month. You divide that number by 12. So can your property, after all the expenses, generate a positive cash flow that is more than $4,300? Right? So I'm kind of keeping it really simple here because I know there's some very, very new people on this call. And um, I don't want you to be super lost. Okay, So that is how we get the free cash flow. So it's your total income minus your expenses. You get what's called the net operating income. And then you take the net operating income and you subtract how much that will cost for the loan. And then you see how much cash flow there is. Now, how do you tell your investors how much, how much is the returns that they're going to get? So if they put, if you're, if you're, uh, if your net operating income is, let's say, 72000 and your debt service is $52,000, and, and, you, and your investor had to put in $200,000, what would the cash-on-cash cash return be? So 72,000 is your NOI. Excuse me. 52,000 is your debt. Your cash flow is 20,000. Investors put in your investor put in 200,000. What's the cash on cash return? <laughs> Come on, I know some of you guys could do this without even a calculator. All right, fine. Don't play. So you take 20,000 and you divide it by 200K. That would be the way that you find, there you go. 
That will be the way that you find your cash on cash for your investors. Okay, so so this is this is a very quick overview of how you analyze deals. Now, what we want to talk about is that NOI. See, if you can if you can real if you can increase that NOI when we're talking about multifamily deals, even single family deals, you want to look to increase the net operating income. In order to know where you can increase that, right? Because net operating income will increase if you increase income, right? That's one way to do it. The other way to increase your NOI is to what? You can mouth it. I can I can lip read. What is lower that? expenses? Yeah, lower expenses, right? Those are the two. I mean, to get NOI, there you go. Thank you. So you reduce expenses. Now the expense side of it, that's where being an experienced operator, if you have done a deal, you can actually be, that's, that's your, that's your contribution to, to an underwriting, to the underwriting portion of it. Cause you will look at the expenses, right? Current expenses that the owner is running and you can immediately tell how they've been running the deal. And then you can tell if there is op opportunities there. So, for example, right, um, one of one of the key points that Robert Martinez mentioned, and this might be this might be this might be some challenge that you're coming up against when we're looking at deals that are owned by mom pop, right? That means by not institutions, not syndicators, but just you know a mom and pop, like some you know one one operator. They've owned it for twenty years, thirty years. And they're trying to sell now. It's time for them to leave. They've already made their money over and over again. There are how many, what is it? The baby boomers in the next couple of years is coming to retirement. What year is that? Monica, you should know that, right? You don't know it? Come on. Okay, so there's a huge amount of baby boomers coming out and there's businesses. Okay, all right. Maybe, yeah, maybe they're already there. But I think there's, I saw it somewhere. There's a huge number in the next couple of years that's coming. That means businesses are going to be exited. They're going to want to be out of their business. Real estate's going to be exited. They're going to be done with their real estate. They've owned it for 20 years, 30 years. They don't have debt on it. They've refinanced it many times. They're just collecting cash flow on it. They don't care if they get the max rent or not. That property needs new blood. It needs somebody new to come in and give it a facelift and give it new, like new energy, right? So you can liven it again, bring life back to the property because it's going to get stale and it's going to die away and wither away. That's why these mom pops are going to be way below market rents because they want to keep them there. And so those are the tenants that are there. Now, here lies your opportunity, right? We can see that as opportunity. Some people will see as, oh, I don't want to touch that. Look at that building, right? It's dilapidated. Nobody's taking care of it. As an investor, if you want to invest in real estate, you always have to think opposite of the masses, which is what presents us a great opportunity today. Interest rates going up. Everybody's scared of buying properties, buying real estate. Ooh, you know, the market's going crazy. We should wait. And everybody's waiting. You know, I have a bunch of mortgage mortgage buddies tight. Their their lives are tight because they don't have they don't they're not making deals, they're not making transactions. So everyone's kind of holding back. Real estate across the board in the whole country is, I don't know, five to fifteen percent less in sales volumes than last year at this time. And that just means simply uh there's a there's a great opportunity for for us as investors um we always got to think opposite of what people are are normally are like collectively thinking if everybody's saying it's not a good time to buy right it's you know let's wait let's wait for the market this is the masses are thinking this because interest rates are high let's get in when interest rates are low but if you understand how interest rates affect the, the price of the property and you truly understood it, right? And I'm going to explain it to, to you. I know there's a, you know, some newer people here, but if you truly understood that interest rates creates 
either, you know, over inflated prices or an opportunity to get in. When interest rates are high, that means the buyer once could have afforded a $700,000 property, or let's go back to that 800,000, right? It's 52,000 for the debt service. That means somebody's got to be able to make about, I don't know, 100, 100, $115,000 to qualify for this deal. And I'm just kind of talking about regular mortgages right now, not commercial. But they could afford that at this at 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 six and a half percent. But when interest rates go up to seven and a half or eight and a half, now they can't because the debt service goes up and now they can only afford maybe a five hundred, six hundred thousand. So when the buying power is gone. Right. This is this is a great opportunity for for us as investors. If you can get deals while interest rates are high, that means deals are lower in prices. When interest rates come down, that's not the time you go in. You go because when interest rates are down, all of a sudden the same person can go back to buying an eight hundred thousand dollar property and he will or she will. And now your property that you got that worked at a certain interest rate, all of a sudden is now cash flow and great because interest rates is lower and people are offering you way more money than what you got the, pro the property for. So while the, while the interest rates are shooting up, this is the time to, to really take advantage, whether it's for you to learn how it works, how the market works, or get into deals, right? Get into deals. Hey, McGenna, welcome. Um, or get into deals now, right? Today. Now, most people are gonna wait, right? That's kind of the 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 collective thinking is let's wait. We don't know if it's gonna go higher up or go down. But the way that this the interest rates shot up. Oh, uh Alex, I cannot listen. I cannot hear you. Yeah, same. Yeah, something went out on your end, I think. Yeah, I heard a beeping and then no sound. All right. Uh, for Hello? Testing, testing, testing. It works. Oh, my God. That's so weird. I don't know what happened. Sounded like it shorted out, and then that was it. So you're good. <laughs> weird. It was a really important part, part two. Most people are waiting to buy buy right waiting waiting to uh waiting for the market to turn oh turn oh it's gonna be a better buy later and this is why most this is why most people buy at the wrong times every time every time when you when you um when people this is kind of like the the investors like i don't know what i don't know what we could, but most people will say oh my god tesla is at an all-time high right now 
Remember when, remember when it was like 800 bucks or we went up to like 800, whatever for, for a stop per, per share. And then we're like, man, if it only came down to, to 700, definitely, especially all the day traders waiting for that. And then it starts dropping and it goes down also down also they're out. Like going. Yeah. You're echoing and repeating. You're like lagging Alex, your Wi-Fi yeah. might be uh, short now. Okay, what about with my phone? It's better. Better? All right. I'm going to just do it on my phone for a minute. Hang on. One moment. All right, we'll do it like this then. So most people are going to miss deals because of waiting and you know for me personally i just like to have good fun melinda welcome great fundamentals about real estate you can carry this great fundamentals from single family uh you know residential all the way to the multifamily space and that's like can you see risk what's the worst thing that could happen you know and robert being on the call with us on Tuesday, he shared a lot about, you know, a lot of great insights about underwriting deals, knowing operations, because you can look at the mom and pop shop, right, the, the deal, and you can know exactly there are key signs to know that they didn't run the deal properly. And if you know that, he's like, I love it. I love deals like that. But they won't be able to provide you the T12 and the documents that big, big deals would when they have a property management company, right? Because that's all ready. You know, they're just going to give you some stuff where bank, like bank accounts are all mixing together and, and nothing's really, you know, can't make sense of anything. Those are great deals because it means there's probably a lot of room. Warren Buffett. Yeah. It's crazy. Warren Buffett says this. Everybody repeats this. And when fear is on the streets, when blood is on the streets, everybody goes home and hides. Everybody's like, nope, now's not the time to invest. Now's the dangerous times. Right. And, it, and it, it's it's challenging across the board. I think everybody when 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 the economy tightens up as a whole, everybody feels it on some level. And. In, in this market is what is going to determine your, if you're going to survive in the, the in, in this industry, right? Or if this, or if you belong in this industry, like, will you have the, the perseverance or the determination and the commitment to go through um, this market when things are challenging? The past 10 years, all we saw was an upward uh, trajectory for real estate. So it was easy. Anybody, anybody can say, I'm going to buy this deal. It doesn't need to, it doesn't even need to cash flow on day one and we can still make money off of it. And they do. Right. So now in those markets like California, New York, uh, Florida, it's starting to be tougher to find deals that could cash flow because everybody wants a lot for their deals. Cause that's what the market demands. That's what the, that's what people are willing to pay. People from New York will go to Florida and say, dude, I'm willing to pay $5 million for this $2 million building. And enough of them do that, all of a sudden prices are extremely high and the cap rates change and everything change. Can you be ahead of that market? Right? So we can we can now, as as we are, you know, in teamship, multifamily, um, we have Zooms very easily be able to look at deals across the country everywhere. And everybody probably has seen, you know, if you're in this circle, it's not a very big circle, really, you know? Um, everybody will everybody will know everyone and everybody can see a whole bunch of deals. Everybody's pitched a whole bunch of deals. I think the important thing is to know, is to align values 
with operators, how you feel about the operator. As much as the deal is important, I think the people, the group or the person that is operating the deal is extremely important for you to be, you know, you feel good with, right? Not just the deal itself. Um, so Robert was talking about a couple of things that, um, that you can do when you're operating to lower the, the NOI. And one of the things that he does is he has his management company sit down with him and he teaches them that NOI is the number that they care, that he cares about, not the income because management companies care about incomes. Their, their compensation is tied to the income. Oops. Oh, all the mic stuff is happening. Sorry. So management companies, their compensation is tied to the income of the property. So they're incentivized to, um, to, to give you, to, to bring higher income. That means if you turn over an apartment, that's good for them. It's bad for you, right? A turnover is somewhere around for, for average apartments, probably three to $4,000, that's how much a turnover costs, okay? To make ready the apartment, to pay and pay the leasing agent, to miss out a month of rent, it's probably around three to four thousand dollars. And if you're looking at a cap rate, okay, of five, right? What is four thousand dollars worth in the valuations? Now I got to pull the now I got to do a reverse. I'll pull the calculator on my on my computer. So the simple calculation and the formula, the only formula you really need to know for evaluating deals is value equals the net operating income divided by a cap rate. So I just told you that $4,000 is the, the cost, right? So that's kind of like the NOI, you can say it's negative, but $4,000 and the deal is in a, a market or the deal is valued at a five cap rate. What's $4,000 divided by a five cap rate? Five cap is 5%, really. It's 80 grand. One turnover in a property in, a, in one unit is evaluated about $80,000. They don't care. Management companies don't really care, right? Because it's... It, they care about the new rent that's going to come in, which is going to be higher. And they get they get their compensation off of the 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 income from it before expenses. So one of the things that I kind of picked up from and, and it's so um, I think if you're in the space of or want to be in the space of managing deals and running these deals or being a part of it. It's extremely important that you stay plugged in, listen to stories, uh, you know, networking with people about how they're doing on their deals. That way you can you're always trying to take back information to do better with your deal. To be a better communicator with your investors, to be a better operator on your deal, to be able to save NOI here and there. Every dollar that you save or that you make on your property is worth between 16 17 to $25 every dollar. I started to, I started to, um, you know, as, as the economy is tightening up, I started to think about every dollar as $16 as $17. Like when I spend it and I'm looking at how much I'm spending on just, you know, we, you got to focus on the numbers. So my wife and I, just like I do my properties now, we once a week do a, do a 515, which is to look at our KPIs or look at our numbers, right? Like how much went in, how much went out, what was excessive, where can we cut? I didn't do that before, you know, and this economy is teaching me that, which is pretty, pretty cool, you know, because I was pretty, you know, Pretty, uh, I don't know what the word is, but 
reckless ish with with spending you know but I, I personally to me i'm like everything that i everything that i spend when calculating value are you using the purchase cap rate or the projected cap rate okay gotcha one sec i personally think that everything i spend money on is an investment that's why i see it that i when i see it that way it's hard for me when, when there's no investment behind it i just can't i it's hard for me to be like yeah let me buy it Right, so I already have that mindset, but I didn't have the mindset of every dollar is actually 16 or $20 until being in the multifamily space and working with our management company on that. We have to remind them every time. And from this conversation with Robert, we're literally going to implement something on Monday's meeting with our, with our management company, with the different ones, that we're going to incentivize expense savings. Robert just did that. He's like, there's four people on the property, right? That's working the property. It's 200 units, so there's four people there. He's like, I think we can cut one, right? If if one person is making $60,000 a year over there, what's the evaluation? What's 60,000 divided by, by a five cap? $1.2 million. Each one of those employees that's on that property is evaluated at costing you $1.2 million on your evaluations. You see how like multifamily kind of puts a lot of things into perspective. I was speaking with somebody today that um, is experiencing what single family looks like you know duplex looks like that's like every dollar that comes in it seems like you just have to spend it on something else and there's no profits and there's a there's a management there's a management in place making like i don't know 90 bucks or something a month right like what what type of property management can you get for for that Right, like that's that's ten percent of your rent. Who's who's gonna pick up the phone at two a.m. for ninety dollars a month? They're not gonna do it. You're gonna have to end up doing it. So as much as there is opportunities in single families and duplexes, and we are looking at smaller units, you know, our team as a whole and our mastermind as a whole, we're looking at smaller deals to take down together as a group. Um. We still, you still see the, you still see that larger units just are safer. You know, it might be harder to take down right now, which means there's a lot of, if you don't think you can come up with the capital to take a deal down, there's risks. And perhaps the, the, there's a lot of different ways to, to capitalize. You can raise the funds before, but you're probably going to need good track record to raise the funds before. That's the best way to do it. But most, a lot of us, me included, um, that are kind of getting into this game, we, we get the deal under contract and then we raise the capital. We put ourselves in stressful situations. So much fun. But um, I want to answer your question, uh, Josiah, is, you know, when you're, when you're looking at a deal, when you're doing the calculation, you do it based on what your the value of your property is, you know, not like the going in cap or anything, just the 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 going rate for your class B or class C, whatever it is in your market. Right. It might change. So Robert was saying that his property should have been somewhere in the, the four and a half, five cap rate. But now they're six, six and a half. He lost a lot of evaluation from that. All right, let's do the same thing again. If we took $60,000, right, at five cap, it was $1.2 million that, you know, this, this maintenance guy costs you in evaluation. What if the deal was, you know, a class A and it was a four cap? The lower the cap rate, the higher the evaluation. So you went from five 
five cap rate down to four cap rate. Now you went from 1.2 million to 1.5 million. That's how much this maintenance guy is costing. Okay, what is cap rate first? Cap rates is basically, right, if you take the same formula, value equals net operating income divided by cap rate. That means cap rate, you move the cap rate and the value into the opposite side. Cap rate equals your net operating income divided by the price or the value. That's the cap rate. Okay, so if you have, um, if you have a property, easy math, it's a million dollars, and your net operating income is a hundred thousand. What's the cap rate? Ten percent. It's a it's a ten cap. Right now, a 10 cap, if you can get something at a 10 cap today, you probably don't even want to go walk the property. It's going to be one of those. Okay, so when, you know, that's the misconception a lot because people, oftentimes people are like, I want, a, I want a seven or eight or a nine cap. When you're asking a broker, they're like, what type of deal you want? You're like, I want a eight, nine cap deal. They know, and then you're like, I want, you know, I want a B class deal, you know, but I want like a, a seven, eight, nine cap, something like that. They'll know how much of a novice you are based on the types of questions you're asking. You know, so it's important for us as we're underwriting and learning, because underwriting and talking to brokers are, are, are hand in hand. The underwriting helps you get the information so that you can have confidence to talk to the brokers. Right, so that's why underwriting and analyzing deals is important. It's it's an important thing to practice. You know, just pra practice it. Like if you can look at all the deals, okay. Let's 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 look at it this way. Let's take an example. So same thing. It's a million. They want a million dollars, right? The the NOI on this deal is um is 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 thirty thousand. Okay, so the NOI is thirty thousand. They want a million dollars. What cap? Let's make it forty thousand. I want to make it so that it's it's more realistic. So forty thousand, right? Let's say it's like a Class C deal, and they want they have forty thousand dollars in income, and they want a million bucks. What cap rate are they asking for? Ten percent. Yeah, nice. Yeah, a four cap, four percent. So they want to for the the and the net operating income is four percent of the price that they're asking. You're like, no, doesn't make sense. Like once you figure out what the NOI is and and you looked at the expenses, you looked at the income, you looked at the expenses. You're like, uh, let's see. I think they're you know they're they're o they're overestimating even their their NOI, right? Because taxes are going to go up, insurance going to go up. But if you know operations, you would know where you can add things where you can deduct things. And then from there, you start to make your offers. Right? That's why it's important to be experienced. You can make your offer. You're like, you know, I, I think this property, if I get it at a six cap rate, okay, now we're gonna do a different math in a second. If I can get it at a six cap and I know I can add to the NOI on this deal, how much should you offer on this deal? $40,000 the NOI. And you want to buy at a six cap rate. Who's got it? Say it again. So you got you, 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 the same deal, right? They want a four cap. They want a million dollars for $40,000 of NOI. But you want to, you can do it realistically at a six cap and knowing when you go in, you can actually increase the income even more or reduce the expense even more. So you know you can get a good deal if you get it at a six cap. So then how much should you offer? Value equals NOI divided by cap rate. The NOI is $40,000. You're looking to get at, at a six cap rate. How much should you offer? Yeah. Six hundred sixty seven dollars. 
666 667,000. That's what you should offer. Now, when you know this, you're like, you know, this and, and you can look at the now you study the market and you see what else is selling and you're like, you know, I'm not that far off. Deals are selling between a 5 and a 5 and a half cap, right? You look at the other deals that have sold, look at their NOIs. And then you're like, if I can get it at a six, I'm definitely making, I'm definitely getting a good deal. Plus, I know this is a mom pop that's running it. And uh, there's these things that I can do, right? Or if you see and you're like, man, they're running at 65, 70% expenses. You know, there's things you can do. So if you can get it at a good deal, and now it's just about the numbers game. How many deals can you underwrite and look at and just make offers? How many, like, maybe you get a no, maybe you, maybe, maybe they completely ignore you and they think you're, you're, you're not serious. Great. That's fine. Do you got other offers? Let's see. What was the question? So what would you approach on telling broker this listing price 1 million? You want to buy a lower? Be like, listen, based on my underwriting, like I would, I would make an offer today. If you can, if you can, if, if you want me to submit it, it's going to be $667,000. You want me to submit it? Now, in today's market, they may. Because they're not getting... Deals are sitting on the market forever. Deals are coming back. Right? There's a lot of deals that were under contract. We have a deal under contract. And there's a lot of deals falling out of contract. I saw these deals when I was looking at my deal. And now, all of a sudden, they're back on the market. See, exiting a multifamily deal. And this is why it's these, these brokers are working. I mean, they, they worked it for a whole seven months and then it falls out of contract. They didn't get money. The seller didn't get their money. But so that's why you never really sell when you have to sell. You sell when you, you're like, yeah, let me just put it out there. The desperation of needing to do something usually creates the, the opposite effect. You know, so now they're going to be even more challenged. They're like, wow, we've been underwater. We've been wanting to get out. We've been wanting to travel six more years, six more months, seven more months just pass by in our lives. And we haven't sold this property. Now they're even more. See, these are all parts of the story. They're all pieces of the puzzle for your offer. And if you looked at a deal and you underwrote a deal today and you offered $667,000 today on this million dollar deal and they're like, heck no. And then you go on with your life, look at a bunch of other deals. And then eight months later, a year later, you see the same deal on the market again, $870,000. And you go back, hey, broker, remember I offered that, that, that money? You know, what happened to the deal? Now you ask about the deal. You're kind of poking at it. And um, and by then, right, six months, eight months, a year down the road, you should be way more experienced now. If you put in the work and you're paying attention, you should be speaking to the broker with a whole new level of confidence, knowing, hey, I might be able to get this deal for 670 And you actually know that if you went 700 you want to know what your max price is. Probably on a deal like that, if you get it for 730, 740, that would be a steal too. And you get it. You cash flow positive. The market comes back, interest rates come back down, cap rates follow interest rates. Okay? Like take take that down too. Note that down. Cap rates follow interest rates. As interest rates go down, property values go up. Property values go up because cap rates and, and that, well, that translates to cap rates going down. Okay. So that's like, I know sometimes it's confusing. I know every time I talk about cap rates, people get confused. So hopefully with that little exercise and just explaining it like that, it helped out a little bit. You know, I know people that's been in this game and trying to learn for like a year and still don't know what the cap rate is. Like, how do you get the cap rate? You don't get the cap rate, you just make it up. Cap rates is up to the majority of the people to decide what it is. And it's up to you to decide. Just because your property 
uh, other properties like it that everyone thinks is a four cap or a five cap doesn't mean you can't offer a six cap you can't you can't make a make a make an offer on it now you got to write a whole bunch of deals okay i i now so seven deals probably like 30 plus deals i've done in my life from all residential and and multifamily combined 30 plus i've underwritten like thousands of deals and it started in the in the single family space but that discipline transition translates over and tr and comes over to the multifamily side the lingo is a little bit different you learn the lingo i didn't know what a cap rate was then either because nobody used cap rates but it's kind of the same thing you know i knew what the returns would be you'd still take the income you look at the expenses and 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 you make a, a return on it you look at the returns so you learn the lingo you use it five times and now you got confidence using it. All right. And you don't use it, use it in a way that you're like the, telling somebody what cap rate is, right? Not like, Oh, what's the cap rate? What's the going in cap rate? What's the going out cap rate? See using that. You're not really, you're still not really going to understand what cap rate is, but when you're making offers and you're thinking, I'm going to get at a six cap interest rates, I might be able to get, lock this interest rate at five and a half. If I can get it at a six, and this is normally a four, I'm going to get a steal. When the interest rates come back down, you're going to make a bunch of money in the evaluation. Now, bad operators can mess up good deals. Good operators can make good of bad deals. So, you know, I, I'm extremely... Of all the different masterminds I'm in, the one that I never miss is Roberts. I don't agree with all of his philosophies, obviously. I, you know, he, he always says, don't do it in team, do it yourself. Do it yourself, up it, up, and, and, there's, and there's logic behind it, right? Go do a single family yourself. Raise capital from one person yourself. Just know you're going to be married to it and you're going to suffer. And then, but you learn and then you trade out and go for a second one. And then you go for, and then you take that, you learn and you suffer and you trade up again. It's a, it's a journey that he took, right? And, and he actually didn't, when, when Robert was in the lifestyles in Houston, money came to him. If you had a deal, money came to you. Today, everybody is fighting over a pool of investors. It's about how creative can you get? What type of reputation can you start to build for yourself? You know? And just like tenant retention, okay, is the most important thing in real estate, your investor communication, your current investors that have invested with you, communicate with them, take care of them, answer their calls, it's not all about finding new investors. And I think if I can just land one like advice for everyone that's getting into the game, and I know at some point you guys will have investors and you got to go find new investors, nurture your old investors. That's how I grew my, my investor base too. And most of them are not really inside the whole little pool that everybody's a part of. You know, now, yeah, I, I'm going to be swimming in there too. I'm going to be fishing there. Fishing. I'm fishing for investors. I uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be there, right? To to present to these to, to in the same pool, of course. But the first people I'm going to reach out to is the people that have invested with me. And I'm like, "Hey, do you know, you know, we got this awesome deal. Do you or anyone you know want to come?" Right? And I know communication has been huge for us. We send out newsletters every single month. I make sure that I make myself available like every single Saturday. I might have missed like two or three in the in the two years. Every Saturday, 1 p.m., I sit my ass down somewhere and I get on the Zoom and I wait for investors to come on. Now, every week so far, there has been some investors on there. It hasn't been a time where it's just like nobody's there. 
because your deals, those are your deals, right? I mean, investors are there. And then I want to be so transparent that I will let my investors be mingling with each other and ask questions crossing over to different deals. We have one deal that people are kind of like worried about. And the other deals are doing great. But we do have one deal that, you know, we... In the, from the very beginning, it was a 16-month uh, delay period, stabilization period for distributions. You know, we're about seven, eight months in. And because, you know, we're transparent. I tell everyone, I'm like, look, we have interest rate exposure on that deal. Not, not a single other deal do we have interest rate exposure. You know, obviously, I partnered up with another team. And I believed in the vision. I believed in the operators. I still do. But, you know, it is in interest rate exposure. Now, we did, we got in at like six and a half, seven percent. But the interest rates right now are 10 for, for us on that deal. We have about a million dollars of reserves and 1.2 in reserves and CapEx. Right. We've already spent about 500,000 on CapEx. And we still have 1.2 million in there. We're, we're still fine. You know, like we are, our rents are not meeting the, 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 uh, the interest rates though. You know, we're about $25,000 negative, but that's because we're also cleaning out. We're only 60% occupied across the board as we're renovating all the entire things. Uh, do you underwrite deals to what? I'm going to try to get back on the computer because I just, you know, talking to a phone, I feel like I'm just looking at one person and my face is over this one person. So I'm going to try it again. Hopefully it works. Testing, testing. Good. Oh, great. Best mic on the market, man. <laughs> um, now I can use the calculator on my phone. My phone, rather. Yeah. So, uh, where was I? Okay. So yeah, on that deal, like we're we're still safe. We're still good. We let our we let our investors know, and we're okay that they're asking us that question in front of other investors on other deals. You know, because I want. I want synergy across everything that I do. I want oneness. So, um, you know, but every single one of our deals on fixed debt and has plenty of, of, of cushion in the deal. Um, is there a chat scrolling? I'm unable to see. Hey, can someone tell me what the last question was? Because I switched over. I missed that question. You want to ask it again, Marlene? Alex, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to know if you underwrite deals for others besides your own people. Uh, underwrite for them? I mean, you can underwrite and sh and and I, you know, I can we can talk about it, especially on this call. Like, I would totally be open open to, you know, if you guys had a deal and you wanted to look at it on this call, and we can, you know give everyone education at the same time time. And I can also, that would be awesome. Like on this call, we would definitely do that. And then on Saturdays, we're going to start to have more of that going as well. We're actually creating. So for you guys here on Saturdays, um, I'm actually going to send out an invite. We are doing, we are going to start like a little TV show type of thing <laughs> with a, with a panel kind of looking at deals and things like that. Um, yeah, and it's, and it's going to be in, in our other, uh, community platform. So it'll be fun. We'll send everybody an invite. Um, yeah, but if you do have a question, uh, about something like I'd be totally open, you know, I'm, I'm, I always make myself really available to people, you know, I'm not, I'm not super big or anything. And, 
And I like I like one on ones, especially new people. I love meeting new people. And if you if you want to reach out to me, okay. 23 people on this call. Nick, can you drop my Calendly on here? Yep. All right. Please don't give this to everyone else. This is for all of you guys here. Feel free to set up a 15, 30 minute call with, with me and chat about anything. If I can, if I can help, I will. If I can't, I'll point you in the right, in the right direction. So where were we? Where was I talking about? Talking about a deal. Yeah. Okay. Just like tenant retention is, is, is the most important thing and the highest cost for your, for your deal, your investors, your current pool of investors, you know, I have a, I have, um, uh, a gratitude morning practice, you know, and every morning I'm like, you know, I'm so grateful for all the people that trust me. So grateful for the, all the people that support me and trust me and have invested with me. Around $10 million right now is what I have of investor money. And um, that I've raised, you know, and um, it's, I'm extremely humbled by that every single day. I think about it. I'm like, I've done something in my life where people will trust me with that. Now, obviously I have a good team. I have good, you know, mentors, good coaches, coaches, good people around me. And, um, you know, I want to foster and create more of that. And so within our, in our Saturday, um, investor calls, like what we also do is like, I help people strategize and plan to the best of my abilities. You know, like somebody asked me today, like, I, should I invest in your deal? Your deal? I'm like, tell me your, tell me your investment strategy. Like, What's your plan? What do you want to do? Is it long term, short term? Like, what is what is what are your goals? And I'll let you know. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe investing with us now is not a good time. So you know, somebody asked me that they they took out a home equity line of credit, and they they took it out at a I think a seven percent interest rate, and they're like, this is our last dollars, but we we we're traveling around the world right now, and we it's just sitting there. You know, should, should I invest it into your Ogden deal? And I was like, well, you know, we have a going in 3%, right? Cash flow on that deal. And it will move up year after year. We are way below market rent. So it's going to be a good deal, but you're going to be negative cash flow. And not only that, the first six months, you're not even going to get any cash. So you just have to front that whole thing. But it's just sitting there anyways. So I'm like, I don't, I don't know if it's the best, best thing for you to do, right? Now, if there was another opportunity, when you're looking for an opportunity that's higher than the than the seven cash return as a passive investor, there's a lot of risk attached to that. Promise you. There's a lot of risk attached to a 7% plus like cash distribution um, returns for a passive investor. And now if you're just loaning, loaning money and you're lateralizing it, that's great, but you're not going to participate in the upside, which is actually where most of the money will be made. But if you want to participate in the upside and you want to get distributions of that and somebody else has got to run it, like unless you're doing a Airbnb type of play, right? Or you're offering preferred. This is what a lot of people are doing is offering preferred returns. It's like, yeah, you're going to get 8% returns on your money a year. It's going to be in the books. You're just not going to get the cash. We're just going to keep it in the books. All right? And then when we refinance, we'll recoup that money. We'll send it back to you. But what's the difference of getting 100% refinance versus getting, you know, now you're like, I'll get out at, you know, you're going to get 80 something percent. And then we're going to tack on the other uh, you know, the percentages that we promised you, right? So basically the deal is dependent on the re the sale, the refinance or the sale, sale. And it just sounds better, right? With preferred. Now we have a deal that's preferred, but that deal is actually cash flowing that, flowing that and we money. See, that's the problem when you have 
when you have a deal that's returning that type of cash flow, if they do it, the deal is going to be tight. The, the people managing the deal will make no money. And when they make no money, they're not going to be very excited to run the deal. People might even be tempted to scrape off the top a little bit because they feel like we, they did some work. That, you know, those things are, are human nature. I'm not saying people are bad or good or whatever based on doing that, you know. Um, that one for me, like I'm not dependent on my multifamily income. But that deal for me, I feel like I'm still so grateful for it that we're actually able to return that type of returns on my first and first deal, first syndication deal. And like, we're just so, we're, we're so happy about it. Make zero dollars. Sorry, probably like 40 something dollars. I raised a million two on that deal. I make $42 a month average. <laughs> so for you guys that are getting into the game as a general partner, you're like, man, I just want to be a general partner. Well, you're going to go and go through a bunch of stress and a whole bunch of learning and probably crying and all this stuff. And, and the first year, year, or if you don't, you know, use those deals as learning, you know, from there, I feel like that deal gave me the confidence. I had the right people around me. I'm still so tight with them now. You know, the, the, we were, we were actually the original legends. You know, we've kind of broken up into different groups now. Groups now, you know, part, part Shoal is massive capital. Part is, you know, whatever other equity they're doing. And, and let's, I just carry the, the name legends on. But you know who's actually the legend? Mike Bailey's the legend. You know, we, I just called him the legend from the time, from the beginning when I met him. So. You know, every time I, I say the name and I think about our group, I feel like it's a, you know, there's an honoring of, of, of Mike Bailey. And some of you guys know Mike Bailey. Him, John Sedoti, Thomas Vargas, Danny Hariki gave me my first shot to be a part of a deal. And I just want to pay it forward. You know, whether you're an invest, you just want to be an LP, or if you want to be a general partner, like I will do everything I can to help make that happen. Um, and so I do think that as, if you want to step into that role, you have to, I'm going to say have to, right? Before, before I used to say you don't have to, but if you don't have the experience in real estate already, I think it's extremely important that you invest money first with, first with somebody as an investor, know what it's like, know how that, know what that whole feeling's like, shit, hundred thousand, thousand dollars out to somebody else kind of into the ether, you know? Like, I hope, it, hope it's over there. Is it still sitting there? Hey, Alex, is our money still sitting there? <laughs> yeah, it's still sitting there, don't worry. Um, but you gotta know what that feels like because at some point, if you wanna transition to this side of the game as a managing, as a as a general partner or, partner or true managing partner of a deal, you gotta know what it feels like to have written that check and now somebody wrote that check to you and then also what it feels like when something happens and you got to say, hey, no distributions. It's not like, hey, no distributions and then no connections, no no conversations, right? It's, hey, no distributions and hey, look, whatever you need. Like, if you need to have conversations with me, let's do it. You know, like tough conversations. One of our deals, Houston deals, insurance out of control. Insurance and taxes out of control. We're still cash flowing, but we went from giving somebody... $300, you know, for, for, for their investment to $80. Like that's, I mean, there's still cash flow, but that's rough. Right. And the conversation, well, didn't you already, how did you not foresee all this? Didn't you project this? Didn't you have, you know, the safeguards to this? And like to a certain, a certain extent, not to the way that Florida and, and Houston just rock taxes and insurance. All right. So I think over the long run, yeah, we're going to recoup and you'll make, we'll make money. But now that two X, two and a half X might be like 1.7, 1.6. Who knows? Five years, seven years. We can take a whole nother turn again and, um, and exit two X, two and a half X. 
I think when real when it comes to real estate, if you can own it for five, seven years, you got you gotta make you gotta double the money. Just by having the property sitting there, it'll be worth though. What's the minimum investment for most of your deals? Um 50 right now on this deal. Um, but you know, 506 and it's a 506 B. So we've, you know, we've had many conversations in these, in these calls together. So it, it will, I would consider that previous, uh, substantial relationship. Now that's, that's their wording. I don't know. Some people say it's six months. Some people say it's nine months. Some people say it's, you just got to tell them that there's risk in the deal. <laughs> That they understand that there is risk. Now they're sophisticated and they're good to invest. I don't know. There's so many, so many things like the SEC just makes everything gray across the board. So it's always up for interpretation. Just like the IRS, like I get my haircut. My wife was like, How did you put this on your business card? I'm like, let's ask Brent. And Brent's like, Well, I was like, well, no, you can't put your haircut on your on as an expense, right? For business. But since you do social media and this is your thing and you have a media thing and you do your own Zooms and lives all, all the time and you get a haircut like once a week, yeah, it's it's a business expense. I'm like, look, see, it's everything that's just so great, so great. You can make a case for everything. You know, I think this is how the wealthy kind of created these loopholes. Right. And we just let's just let's dance on the gray line with them. That's that's kind of my thing. And as long as we're doing the right things, like our intentions are right, our actions are right, we're in integrity, it's going to be fine. Right now, I'm not saying to break the law, because even like, think about it, even 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 uh, Pace Morby's sub two, sub two is not legal in like half the countries. Actually, sub two to the bank isn't even legal. They can call they can call your they can call your money. They can call it. Anytime you make that, you, you sign that paper, they can call the loan. Is there incentive for them to call the loan? Now we got to look at that. Right? I don't know. Is it, is it more profitable for them to exit the small loan that's on that property and make you get a new loan? So they'll call the loan or they let you, let you play of just putting no money down and taking over the deal and getting the title signed over to you with a contract. I did that. I did that back in the day, lease options. We just actually did a seller financing recently. Um, seller financing is different from sub two. Our home is paid off estimated with 901.2 million. Need some work, would you take out HELOC, HELOC versus credit? HELOC is a line of credit. The lock part is line of credit. Says here, home equity, home equity line, then invest in another piece of property. Do you, but can you do quick claim, do on sale clause? Yeah, but the bank can still, so there's two separate questions. The bank can still call that. You can do a quick claim, but it's not. In the in the mortgage documents, they can call it if that happens. If you put your own your your own property that you bought under your own name and you go and stick it into an LLC, they can call the loan on that. Yeah, it's the due on sale clause. So yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, I guess there's probably ways around, there's probably insurance for it. But I'm just saying, like in the in the in the state of sub two is actually not legal, just in general. You know, so there's a lot of, but nobody's calling it. I've seen any any bank actually call the loan on somebody before. That's doing, you know, transactions like that. The interest rates on the second mortgage on your primary home is lower compared to the. Yeah. Uh, maybe I don't know. I don't know what the percentages are at, and on the HELOCs right now. I know my buddy that just called me is um, I think six and a half or seven right now on the HELOC. And I think if you were to get a mortgage right now, it's probably seven or eight, something like that.
right? And, and credit score doesn't even like make that big of a difference right now because it's just so tight. Banks are going under. The company that I used to work with so much, I love them. All I have to do is just sign my name and it's all good. They just went under. They just closed their doors in the middle of our refi. From our construction loan. They want to live in Chicago. It's kind of yeah, good. Connect with Chicago. Oh, you were in Chicago. I was just in Chicago. Man. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so Pace has done like a thousand of those, right? Five of them were called, but, you know, if he was prepared for it, then, right, then it's no big deal. It's part of, you know, five out of 2,000 or 3,000 is, is perfectly acceptable. But those are the risks. I mean, in real estate, there's risks, risks across everywhere. You got to manage the risks. Like knowing that, you know, adjustable rates. I was always skeptical about adjustable rates. Low rates. Now, people out really well, and I've used it too. But every time I have adjustable rates, I'm like always looking at the at the treasure, looking at these because I'm I'm like, oh man, like I'm looking at it like it's a stock in my phone or or a Bitcoin in my phone. I'm like, wait, where is it moving today? Now, usually it doesn't move that much, you know, but in the past year, it did move a lot. So, yeah, there's just there's just things that you got to consider in real estate and you got to underwrite them. Now, as conservative as anybody wrote in their underwriting last year, no way they could have predicted what went down in 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 the interest rates, you know, the Fed, the Feds. So then how do you pivot? See, as an operator, you got to pivot. And then also for you guys that are on this call, if you're spending time on this call, like, what are you picking up? What are you learning? Right? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of people, people that are just, you know, that guy that had his whole portfolio taken down, right? Like, well, not his whole portfolio yet, but yet, but it's, it's a dominoes effect over there. Um, you know, people are bashing it. He was over leveraged and it was this and it was that. He raised like a billion dollars for his deals. Right? Like where was all that bashing then? So, so you know, I have, I have just tremendous compassion for everybody that's involved. Somebody that I spoke with actually knows some, some people involved in there, GPs and LPs. So, you know, I just have tremendous compassion for everybody that's kind of going through that whole thing. Grant Cardo method. Uh, I'm not sure what that really means. Syndications? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many different ways to do real estate, you know, and I think I, I always... I'm always like someone that wants to help people get into the first one. So whether it's a whatever type of deal you want to do, like I've got a lot of experience in real estate and I can help you um, with that. You know, I can help at least give you some advice and, and all that. Yeah. Six and a half. Wow. Yeah, Leo. Yep. Exactly what I said. Yeah. Now it's just, can we pivot? Can we still stay positive? Can we have these type these types of stations, you know, without like bashing anybody? Let's just focus on the lessons and the learnings because this, what's going on in the market is a, is a, like, like a reality check for everybody. All right. There's people that were buying deals, didn't care if it was cash flowing or not. And it's just like, what's well, like, well, your projection returns are going to be this. And banks are like, yeah, we're down with it. We'll give you a loan, you know, for your future projections. I don't know. I mean, there's, it's, it, that's a lot of risk. I mean, we are, we are building houses and flipping them as well. So I'm, I'm playing that game, but I, my, the investors that I have in those deals are not investors I would put into my multifamily deals. Or vice versa, sorry, the other way around. Those investors are, are you know, they got they got tolerance. They got the risk. They got the, they know the risks. 
And I'm like, yeah, fine, let's do it. Um, but you know, for people that are just kind of starting the investment, like you want to, you want to give them a win, you know, a multifamily is, is pretty good for that. I think, um, you can always buy good operations, operations stuff. You can budget, save it no matter what's going down, you know? So, okay. Any questions, any thoughts, thoughts? I just went on tangents for a while. I do want to, um, Nick and I have a, have a little company marketing company we make shorts and make videos for people and um our we have our our editors have some some extra space we actually bought them uh, a really nice computer computer that knit, and she's able to take down she's able to do a lot more videos so we're just gonna put this package up here real quick Yeah, email this to me, Nick. How am I supposed to? Okay, here we go. So yeah, it'll be a super, um, super, super affordable 16 shorts that we edit for you and um, for, per month. That's four videos a week, 500 bucks a month, three month, three, three month come in. So if you're interested or nobody, know anybody interested, we're probably only going to do like a couple people like this, you know, and then... Um, yeah, so it's a good good way to get started, good way to get consistent, good way to kind of put yourself, uh, keep yourself accountable to creating content. Like content is more important than ever now. Last year, part of my part of my my part of my ten million raised, the one one point five million came from Instagram, and I haven't even leveraged ads. It's, you know, I've even done the five hundred six C like that yet. So, you know, I I plan um to be more social media uh, way to raise capital in the future. So there it is. All right, you can take a picture or you can reach out the, the, the my, what's it called? My, my calendar leads and actually in the chat somewhere. Any questions, any thoughts? So just to kind of recap, um, cap rates move with interest rates. Right? That was one of the recap for it. Could you give me an example on how you would approach someone to invest? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, Marlene, we're, 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 uh, I usually, usually it's going to end up with, Hey, what do you do? You know, I'm like, Hey, what do you, what do you do? You know? And they're like, I'm a, I'm a doctor or I'm a, you know, I do this or I do that, whatever it is. And I just wait for them to ask me what I do. See, it's got to be a very like organic thing. You just got to have it prepared. And then in conversations, I would drop like, you know, we're, that's why I do real estate or, you know, that's why I don't really pay taxes and I feel bad, you know, like whatever, whatever the conversation is, you can naturally kind of guide it a little bit in that direction. But the most important thing about raising capital is like, you gotta, you gotta like know the mood, know the vibe, right? If somebody doesn't respond to you talking about multifamily or or whatever, just continue on with the conversation about baseball, about Miami losing right now, right now both the Stanley Cup and the NBA Finals, you know, and Vegas is going to take down the uh, the the hockey game or whatever the Stanley Cup. Yeah, I mean, you can do a thirty second pitch, or you can just like roll it roll it into conversation. I basically roll it into every conversation. I drop a little little nitbits you know i'll be like talking about vegas now i talked about vegas and he's like oh hey you know i heard that oakland A's going to be oh yeah you know all these big institutions moving in and and i think it's whoever is investing here is, is, is smart <laughs> you know we, that's why we're working on a 30 unit over here and, and in, in the best location of of that and then they're like oh yeah tell me more okay then we go into that so the I think the, the most important part of raising capital and you want to approach somebody to invest is you just got to feel out the conversation. You know, like I wouldn't just approach people with the wholehearted intention of just, I'm going to get you to look at my deal. You know, so many people, I, I, so I have my, my, I have a team that kind of messages and DMs people on Instagram, you know, and, and, and LinkedIn as well. So we like, you know, I build this build relationships and, 
and I'll give out my Calendly here and there to set up calls. And some people are just like, you know, genuinely want to want to connect. As soon as we get on the call, I just had this happen to me yesterday. We get on the call. Two other people are trying to get into the call too. I'm like, what is this? He's like, oh, can you let my, my, my friends in? I'm like, okay. They come in and it's straight up sales pitch, right? They like, it was this person obviously didn't know much has connected us and put us on a call. I mean, I mean, that is the, I don't know if you can ever close any, a deal like that. If you were to approach an investor that way, like no way they would invest with you. Just like the moment that happened, I couldn't even listen to what they were selling me. It might've been the best thing in the world. I, I might've missed out on an opportunity, but because of that, like, I don't know, that bait and switch and that full wholehearted intention of like, oh, you know, I really want, you know, I love what you're doing. You know, you're so motivational with your video. I love this, love that. And then just turned it in, like, that is, that is a, you know, for, for sales wise, you know, and raising capital wise, like that's not what you want to do. Or like, there's a lot of people that do that. They don't even, they don't care about the conversation with you. They just want to be able to drop you their pitch and let you know that they got a deal going on. Nothing wrong with it. I just don't think it's very effective. It's not, at least not very, I don't know how effective it is actually, actually. Maybe they go a thousand times and, you know, it's just all a numbers game. I just really care about relationships. You know, I think I just, I just find it really interesting. I think everybody's got amazing stories. I'm always trying to find out what the story is. Because, you know, it's, it's the coolest thing. And actually, McGenna actually spoke about this, this on, on call I was on when she was speaking, is being a connector. You know, and until she actually said it, I didn't know, didn't know that I was doing that too, and I enjoyed it. And then I started to notice every time I, when I see McGenna at a, at a, at a, or something, she's like, Oh, do you know this person? Oh, do you know Alex? Like, I'm like, Oh my God, it's like a, it's a skill and you can do it just so naturally, but like authentically where people don't feel like you're actually trying to do something. All right. So I think that's the most important thing that we will learn about approaching somebody to invest is you're going to go through the process until you're, until you're natural, but do it. Do it as much as you can. Try it. Now, the one thing I would say about investments, when you show somebody an investment, never leave it open. Don't leave it open-ended. Hey, just let me know if you're interested. Get back to me, you know? Always have create a reason to have a conversation again. Like somebody looked at our deal and, um, you know, they were they interested to be in. And I was like, like oh, they were like, oh, you know, after, you know, considerations we wanted to we wanted to buy this duplex here in our backyard instead i'm like oh so tell me more about what you're doing you know with that right and like can you know what what about the two the two to make you choose that one i really i'm just curious right and i'm good i'm good that they chose those that i'm like i don't have anything around it at all and i'm like so do you like you know your goal i mean you want to get into multifamily, so i mean so, i mean that's a part you're going to learn i don't criticize you know i still encourage and um and i think it's important i'm boring i'm just like no oh, do you want to be followed up with like when we have another deal yeah please see because sometimes when people reject you they actually feel awkward and they actually just kind of stay away from you but i open i can i made sure that i didn't let that happen it's up to you if it's to be it's up to me all right so i made sure that like okay hey no, no hard feelings at all. If we have other deals. You want me to follow up with you? Great. Let's follow up. Like I have people that have watched me do deal after deal after deal. And then out of the blue, finally being like, yeah, I'm ready to invest in this one. I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about it since the first time you asked me. A no is never a no forever. A no is just like, not right now. Either I don't have the money, I don't have the funds, or I need to watch what you're doing a little bit, a little bit more. And you get to continue to nurture and build relationships. And this is why a CRM is extremely important too. And like, I've had great success with, <laughs> do I have a book on how, how to close the deal? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't had the, the, the ability to sit down and write for a long time. You know, I wrote, I do have a book that's pretty, that's kind of like 70% finished. Cust customer relationship management. 
client relationship management. So we actually have one. If you guys want to check it out, it's called Legend CRM. And my protege right there, Nick, and two other genius marketers, we put together like an entire flow for everybody. You have some good end closing statements. <laughs> Write them down. I don't know what they are. I forget them. I forget them as soon as I say them. Um, yeah, just just a lot of a lot of the ways. Just never leave it up to them. That's where I was. That's where I was at. I don't know how I got to the that. But what I did was I went to my CRM and I put their the little info in there because I might forget them a year down the road when they message me again. I might. So I talk to like a thousand people a month. So, you know, I might, but I'll put a note in there. And when we talk again, all I have to do is look up their name and look at the notes. The last time we talked, they said they're going to buy a duplex. And then, then two years later, when we talk, hey, how's that duplex coming along? Like, oh my God, he remembers, he cares. How's he remember? I don't remember. Something else remembers for me. <laughs> it's got to have a process, you know? So, yeah, when people opt into the CRM, I got to go, you know, you take a couple minutes and it's, I haven't, I, I'm not super disciplined with this, but sometimes when I remember, I'll go back into my CRM, which I only recently learned how to use because Nick, run, Nick runs it for, but, you know, entering people's information and in notes. Like they opted in. It's right there. It's top couple people that are in your, in your funnel. Write some information. Hey, we, I just talked about, you know, I, I went to a meetup, come back home. You know, I see the, I see the information. I see their names. And I write down like this person is, is, uh, is in the mortgage business, moved to Florida from Spain, you know, and is looking for this or that. Just something, I, something that I remember in the conversation. Right. A, it helps me remember it like now. And B, it's I can look back to it later. You know, and the CRM will save your conversations, help you nurture your clientele. Like my thing, if you opt into mine, you're gonna get an auto response from a text message that says, Hey, you know, good to meet you. This is my Instagram. Check out my Instagram because I'm I, you know, I'm I'm all about right now, just focus on my Instagram. So, so check out my Instagram. They come on, they're like, oh, look. It's cool. Great. Great. He puts on a lot of content. See your page, your Instagram is a huge representation of you and what you do. Cause they may not know anything, but they see the discipline of videos. They're like, wow, he's definitely up to something. That's why getting these videos, like six, 16 videos for you for 500 bucks. That's like extremely cheap. You just got to make some videos. We edit it for you. Make it look, it look good. You post that thing. And uh, do it one every two days, minimum, minimum one every two days. If one a day for a whole year, you will change, not just your Instagram, but you will change. Your message becomes clearer. The way you talk to people becomes clearer. You just get natural at it. You know, one of the most challenging things for people to do is to look at a phone and make a video or have camera on and speak in front of the camera. Like so many people that we're working with and that I even done myself, you know, like the bloopers. Make a blooper reel. Nick's got a blooper reel for me. You know, make a blooper reel just like you trying to say something and just sound completely ridiculous or lose your train of thought. And you got to do it again and reshoot. Like that practice is invaluable. And if you do that for a whole freaking year, you will change. Your business will change. Everything will change. change. So. Yeah, that's what we got going. And um, yeah, it's a good little starter package. Package cheap. You go anywhere else, you're paying like $1,500, $3,000, Someone tried to offer me that for $10,000. A video a day, consultation, and a content strategy. And we'll help you write some scripts. I'm like, Bam. 10 Gs a month. Nah not doing it <laughs> but you know like for for others like i'm sure sure i looked really professional so they probably would take my whole thing to another level too but i don't need to <laughs> you stop stumbling over your words eventually i don't know eventually 
we'll find I'll, I'll find out i'll let you know when that happens because i'm i'm stumbling over shit all the time <laughs> and losing my train of thought as i'm speaking but okay i hope that i hope that there was some value you took away something from these calls you know i like i, I just like being on here all right leo thanks for being here brother um you know i just like i like i like people just like these conversations whether it's 20 people or 200 people it's, it's fun you know and, I, and this now i get to just focus on one page of people people so thanks for being here and if you guys know like okay one of the easiest ways to marlene for to get people into invest investing too especially if you're new you're probably going to be talking to people like new also right and you're and, and they're going to be like well why the hell why the hell will we what you're saying you know, and why, why would we, why would we invest with you and in all of that? Like what you're telling them about real estate won't land. You can't repeat what Grant Cardone says and try to land it for somebody when you don't, don't really experience them. They know you don't got it. So you would just say, Hey, this, I, I got this, you know, so much value on this like Thursday night, day night call or Monday night call. Um, here's a link. Just come check it out. I'm gonna be there. Let's, let's go. Just come, come join it. And then verify. See, follow up follow-ups not just like hey i sent you the link did you make it you should know if they made it and when they're on the call you ask the the facilitator the questions that you want them to hear you become that person it's so easy you gotta leverage the, leverage these calls you know like whether it's my buddies get on the call invite somebody right if especially it's a great topic and especially if it's like introductory in nature ask these questions like especially on this call is 20 calls like answer everybody's question every single person right, you bring somebody on here who's like skeptical about multifamily and you go and you ask a question hey what's the difference between multifamily and single family which one would you invest into what's the pros and cons now you're telling them something without telling them something on this call because it's my stage stage automatically have authority on instagram on social media because it's your stage you automatically have authority and so you want to you want to use that those are the the the, the, the power powers like the, um you gotta understand the laws of uh, laws of power you know and um and that would be great yeah if you're new and you just want people to learn like yeah all right, cool. Yeah, cool. Sound side. Talk to you later. Okay. So I hope there was value. And, um, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time now because I know it's, uh, we've gone like five minutes over now. Uh, super great to see you guys. Thank you, Kalina, for coming here again as well. I saw, saw you on Monday night and, and you said you were coming and here you are. And um, I remember you because you had your camera on the first time. So, you know, for, for anybody that's new also come on to these calls, like be ready, like come on to the call, have your, have your cameras on so that people remember you when you're asking a question, I'm like, I can put a face with the name and that's how you become known yourself. All right. Well, fantastic evening, everybody. Thank you for, for hanging out with me tonight. And um, I'll see you. See you guys. Uh, <laughs> I'll see. I'll see. Thanks, Jay. I'll see you guys uh, on Monday. On Monday or whenever. And bye. <laughs> all right. Take care. Take care, everybody. You're all amazing. Have a fantastic night.